tonight is we're only doing one thing. Uh, actually, two things. I'm going to sing a solo, and Bobby's going to come. <laughs> Why do you laugh like that? Where's Bobby at? Is she around here? Oh, great. Hey, Bobby, could you also, could you start uh, by talking about people who have their feelings hurt? I heard Bobby a couple of years ago, and uh, I came back home, and I told my wife, I said, this is, this, what she has to say is so powerful. I've been to seminary, and uh, at seminary, they talked to us about grief, and they taught us wrong. There's many things that when Bobby said, hey, don't do this, do this, and I went, uh-oh, I'm doing it wrong. And so I got to tell you, what she has to say tonight is so powerful. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we have people live streaming tonight. We're so glad to have you if you're live streaming tonight with us and being a part of our, our service that way. I'm going to pray, and then after I get done praying, I'm just going to say Bobby Real. And when I say Bobby Real, I just want you to just explode with clapping for uh, this wonderful person that's been gifted by God uh, to help people in the area of grief. And I'm, I'm really serious about that, Bobby. God has gifted you in this area. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we know that when somebody's hurting, when they're going through a time of grief, that your heart breaks. And we also know that uh, you have put us in places, Lord, where we are rubbing shoulders with people every day, with people that some of them are just heartbroken over things. And so I pray, Lord, as Bobby talks, that your Holy Spirit would move through her so that we would be able to be better uh, helpers, uh, people that walk with people through some tough times. Lord, there's some Stephen ministers here tonight. I pray you'll bless them as they hear this. Lord, give them wisdom and knowing what to do and help them pick these things up. There's small group leaders here tonight, and I pray that you would bless them as well. Help the, the small group leaders to really key in on these ideas. This is so important. Uh, use Bobby tonight in a great way. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Bobby Real. Yeah. Love it. Well, I'm going to come up here because if you didn't notice, I'm a little challenged uh, in height. And so this way you can see me and I can see you. It is truly a delight to be here. I love doing this. And uh, for me, this is totally fun. And I don't know uh, if talking about how to help those that are hurting sounds like fun to you, but it just, it just tickles my bone. And I am so glad that you are here and that you care enough about doing a great job. Because tonight, what my goal is for you is to help you hit the mark when it comes to helping those that are hurting. And just like Craig said, sometimes the information we have is not effective. So I'm going to help you do this. Now, if we were going to hit the target, we might want to look at some of the equipment that we have that will help us accomplish the job we want to accomplish, right? Now, on my table, I've got a number of things right here. Uh, first of all, when you think of a target, uh, probably you might think of a compound bow, because that would be able, uh, how many of you would be able to hit the bullseye with a compound bow? Um, not an overwhelming response there. So what's with that? So we might not choose a compound bow, right? If I tell you I want you to hit the, the bullseye and hit the mark on this. So, okay, so we might not choose a compound bow because we're just not familiar with using that instrument, although it would probably be the best one, right, to use. But we might want to look at a spoon. How many of you are familiar with using a spoon? And you might say, okay. I'm used to this one. I think I could handle that. But if you'll notice this spoon, I've had this probably for a couple of years, and I haven't used it. Now, that tells you that I don't do a whole lot in the kitchen, right? So I probably wouldn't use this either. The next instrument I have is a hammer. Now, I know how to use a hammer, and I bet everybody out here knows how to use a hammer, right? And if I were going to tell you that I'm going to hit this target and I'm going to hit the bullseye with this hammer, most of you would say, yeah, I can do that. Pretty easy, right? So look at this. Here I go. 
Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this hammer, put it way back, right? Oh, <laughs> well, it took me a couple of tries, but I did it, right? Would you say that that was a pretty good job? <laughs> Some would say it's a good job. I hit it. I used a tool that I was familiar with, and I hit the target, and I even hit the bullseye. But, wow, standing back and looking at it, hmm, I think I did a little bit more damage than what was necessary, right? Well, tonight, what I'm going to help you do is I'm going to give you some tools to hit the target and hit the mark when you want to help other people. And I can guarantee it's probably not going to be tools you're used to using. But I want to take out all of the guessing, guesswork of what to do. I don't want you to end up standing back after you've worked with someone and say, wow, I wonder if I did more damage than good. I want you to know what to do and how to help those who are hurting. That's our strategy tonight. Because my guess is that every single one of you that are here have love, got compassion, right? And you've got the desire to help. But the truth of the matter is, you may be guessing on some other things on what you're doing. And tonight, I want to help you to know that love, compassion, and desire are not enough. you got to have the right tools, and the correct information. So tonight, what we're going to do, first of all, is I'm going to let you know how important this correct information is. In fact, correct information is so important because the problem is we do not know what we do not know. And not only that, the other thing is, is that what we do know that we have been taught by well-meaning people we assume is correct information. So tonight, I'm actually going to be challenging that theory that everything that we've been taught by well-meaning people is correct information. So I hope that you'll kind of stick with me on this. And I want to share with you how we've been socialized to uh, understand grief in an incorrect, ineffective way. Okay, you ready to go? Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. We're getting ready to take off tonight. And first of all, I want you to understand that in our society, we've been socialized to intellectualize grief. And it's so important for you to know that grief is a matter of the heart, not the head. But without even realizing what we're doing, we can actually intellectualize it when we're working with someone who is grieving. For instance, we have a death in the family. A person maybe has lost their spouse. And we might say, especially if it was a long-term illness, we might say, you know what? At least he's no longer suffering. He's in a better place. All things work together for good. Heard that one? Now, the truth is, those are true statements, are they not? He could be if he's, if he's a Christian and has that faith to believe that there is a life after death. Yes, he could be in a better place. True that he's no longer in pain, correct? Yes. All things do work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But the truth of the matter is the griever is not there. The griever is dealing with heart emotions. Now, why do we tend to intellectualize it? We tend to uh, uh, intellectualize it for a number of reasons, but part of it is, I think, is because we don't know what to do with their feelings. And that may, can, sometimes feels a little bit awkward. But the truth of the matter is, we need to learn how to not be intimidated or feel awkward with the expression and the appropriate expression of their emotions. Because remember, if you get something out of this, I want you to understand that grief is not a matter of the head. It is a matter of the heart. Got it? 
Okay, so we tend to intellectualize uh, grief. The other thing that you'll notice is that when someone is expressing their emotions and you don't know exactly what to do, just don't worry about doing anything. Just be careful not to try to take them from the heart to the head. Let them cry. Have Kleenex available, but please, get this, don't offer it to them. Just have it available for them so that if they want to use that Kleenex, they can. But you don't want to give them the impression that those tears are bad, that they need to wipe them away. So if someone is just letting them run down their face, will that be all right with you? Might feel a little awkward, huh? But the truth of the matter is it's okay. Let those tears just come down. And if you have tears that are coming down too because your heart has been touched, you can let those tears go too. In our society, we have been so trained, haven't we, to maintain our composure and yet, I want to tell you that it's okay to let those feelings be expressed. Also, think about in our society what we, how we even deal with death, how we even talk about death. Uh, do you say he's died? He died last week? In our society, look at how we say, refer to death. We might say passed on. Expired, that one I like. You know, I mean, I just don't get it. <laughs> expired like okay the the expiration dates up and and you're out um, but expired gone to heaven went to be with the Lord as if talking about death and he's died or she's died is somewhat maybe off limits to talk about have you ever thought about these things isn't it incredible, some of the things that we have been uh, socialized? Well, here's one for you. Most of us have been socialized to believe that feeling sad is bad. In other words, we get this message, don't feel bad. And in fact, most of us got this when we were in elementary school. Do you remember coming home one day after a hard day on the playground? And maybe you had a fight with your friend or a fight on the bus. And all of a sudden, here you are coming into home and mom greets you or maybe grandma, one of your nurturers. And as soon as you get in the house and the little tears start coming down your face, what do they say? Don't feel bad. Don't cry. And the message is, is that those sad feelings are inappropriate, isn't it? We don't want you to feel bad. So what's the next thing grandma offers? Or mom, what? Here, have a cookie. And you'll feel better. The truth of the matter is you don't feel better with that cookie. You just feel different. But haven't we all been socialized since very young that it's not appropriate to feel bad or sad? And so that's why so many of us, honestly, run to the refrigerator, run to the cabinets, you know, and eat the whole bag of chocolate chip cookies. Because we've gotten this message from way back when, don't feel bad, here, have a cookie. Here, have a brownie. Have a hot fudge sundae, go get a pizza. Go get one of those big juicy whatever. <laughs> And the truth of the matter is, is that's the message that we've got. Don't feel bad. Now, let me ask you another question. Have you ever heard someone say, don't feel good? <laughs> don't feel good? Oh, you just got married? Oh, don't worry. 50% of marriages end in divorce. Don't feel good. <laughs> but somehow, in our society, we've got the impression feeling good is okay, but don't feel sad because we don't know what to do with your sadness. That makes me feel uncomfortable. And when you're working with someone who's hurting, please remember it's not about you. And you don't have to have all of the answers, but we do want to help you not to give the wrong answers and not do the wrong thing, right? 
Okay, so uh, we would never say, don't be happy. I, I really don't want you to be happy. Let's look at something that'll take that happiness away from you. And yet that's exactly what we do when someone is sad. We say, don't be sad as if that is not appropriate and not okay, and we want to take those sad feelings away. So what do people do then? What have we trained ourselves to do when we are feeling sad and bad? What do we do? Stuff it with food, ignore it, try to avoid it, but I'm here to tell you it'll come out one way or the other. So what we want to do is learn how to deal with it effectively. Now that we're talking about feelings, uh, let's talk about feelings a little bit. Because another way we've been socialized in our country is that some feelings are wonderful, positive, and to be preferred. Other feelings we've got labeled as being bad or negative. Is that not true? Okay, when we think of something, a feeling that's positive, what do you think of? Name a positive feeling. Joy. Happiness. Love. Right. Okay, and yet, all of us, I bet, sitting here in this room, know and of times when love misdirected has had horrible consequences right? So I believe it is not the feelings that are good or bad, positive or negative, okay? That's important. But rather, it's what you do with those feelings that determine the results of whether it's good or positive. Got it? So I like to think, oh, and let's look at the negative emotions that have been labeled in our society. What's one? What's the first one that comes to your mind that we kind of consider as a negative emotion? Anger. Anger. We would all agree with that, wouldn't we? And yet at the same time, if you take the energy, and there is a lot of energy with anger, is there not? If you take the energy of anger and properly channel it, I bet all of us can think of some positive outcomes. I've got the cleanest house. <laughs> After being angry, right? But even more than that, look at some of the organizations that have been formed out of anger. We've got Child Find. How about MAD? Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Do you see that emotions are not good or bad, positive or negative? Emotions just are. So right there, I want you to grab that new line of thinking. I like to think of emotions as being the taste buds of life. All right? Imagine, if you would, that you go to Sweet Tomatoes with all that they have to offer, or maybe Golden Corral, or Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. <laughs> By the way, uh, do you guys know uh, Mel Stewart? Mel Stewart was actually the director of the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and he just died Thursday, August the 9th, 83 years old, in his home in Los Angeles. I thought that was kind of interesting because I love chocolate. When I thought of the taste buds of life, you know, of what I enjoy, I thought, ooh, chocolate, the chocolate factory. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, when you go to any kind of buffet, what do you have there? You have a wide variety of flavors. You have the sweet, the sour, the cold, the hot, a sizzling steak, and look at that chocolate um, hot fudge sundae that melts in your mouth. And yet, on this buffet, there are some flavors that are more enjoyable for you, some that are more palatable, and some that maybe you don't care as much about. Maybe you don't like anchovies on your pizza. Maybe you don't like that sour or the texture of some of the foods. And yet the truth of the matter is, our emotions are like that buffet. They are the taste buds of life. And as we begin to see and experience those emotions, the more we begin to understand how important they are. So feelings aren't good or bad, positive or negative, they just are. 
it's what you do with them that counts. Now, other misinformation that we've gotten uh, is what I call the six myths of well-meaning people. We've already talked about a little bit about the first one, don't feel bad. But I want you to kind of go on this journey with me. Uh, imagine John. Johnny is five years old. And one morning he wakes up and he calls his dog like he has done every morning since he was even able to talk. Only this morning, Johnny's little dog doesn't come to him. And so he calls again, and his dog doesn't come. So finally, Johnny gets up, and he goes to see his little dog. And his little dog, he kind of shakes the little dog, and the little dog doesn't move. And so Johnny's mom observes this, and she does the best she can regarding how Johnny needs to learn about death. Now this is the first time that Johnny's really ever experienced death. So to be real honest with you, Johnny doesn't know what to do. But he misses his best friend. So Johnny begins to cry. And he cries and he cries and he cries and he doesn't understand what happened to his little dog. So eventually, Dad enters into the picture, and he sees after several days that Johnny continues to cry. And so what does Dad do? Dad says, don't cry, Johnny, meaning don't feel bad. On Saturday, we'll go and we'll get you a new puppy. End of case, right? Wrong. But they do go on Saturday, and they do get a new puppy. And Johnny has this new puppy, and he loves the new puppy. But to be honest, it's not his dog. It's not his best friend. And so Johnny continues to grieve. But he has learned already from his dad not to cry. So what does Johnny do? You know, he's learned not only that he shouldn't cry, but we've also learned that we replace the loss. How many of you have died, tried this? I have, as a counselor, counseled people going from one bad relationship to another bad relationship to another relationship on. And if we lose one thing, we go out and we try to replace it. We don't even realize what we are doing. And the truth of the matter is, replacing the loss does not help resolve the grief. But these are the two things early on that Johnny begins to learn. Don't feel bad. Don't cry, and then replace the loss. And then later when uh, John was in junior high, uh, he was in school, sitting in school one day, and all of a sudden he got this message, and the teacher announces before the class that, John, we just got a message that your grandfather has died. Now, John was very, very close to his grandfather, in fact, his grandfather was his hunting bu a buddy, taught him to fish, and uh, they just did all sorts of things, camping together. They were buddies. And so John, even though he was in school, was not able to maintain his composure and began to cry. So evidently, the teacher felt a little bit embarrassed, maybe even for John. So what did she tell John? She told John, John, I know that um, this is kind of hard for you, so why don't you go down to the office and um, be where you can be alone so you can grieve alone. Another important misinformation that we all learn. Now, this information was also reinforced when he got home because when he got home, his dad and his uncle happened to be there and his mother was sitting on the couch crying. She had just lost her father. And John wanted to go to his mother. He wanted to kind of embrace her and, and talk to her and cry with her. Only dad uh, and uncle tell John, John, just leave your mom alone. 
She just needs to grieve. She'll be okay. Just leave her alone. So already, by the age of junior high, he's learned, don't cry, which means don't feel bad, replace the loss, and we grieve alone. How many of you have done that? We kind of isolate ourselves, go in our room. I had um, one couple that was in one of my first grief recovery classes, and I'll never forget when we were talking about this myth of grieving alone, it's like when you need someone the most, we feel like we have to be isolated. And, uh, and that's exactly what they had done. They had each grieved alone. And when they found out, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, uh, next one, that we have the message that we need to be strong for other people. And when they found out, oh, you mean that's a myth? I don't have to be strong for my wife. I don't have to be strong for my kids. I can actually cry. We can grieve together. I want to tell you, they were so happy, they wanted to leave the class at that point. Because all along, they had never felt like that what happens if we start grieving alone? It's almost like if we take off that cork, will we be able to stop? And the truth of the matter is, yes, you will. But being able to grieve together is so important. So you don't need to be strong for each other. This was reinforced with Russell. Because when Russell was in high school, his um, grandmother actually moved in with them when his mom had to take a job and work outside the home. So uh, Russell's grandmother actually became the caregiver for his younger, son, uh, younger brother. And when she passed away, uh, he came home and his uh, father told him, he said, you need to be strong for your little brother. Now, Russell didn't know what that means. What does that mean to you? Be strong for somebody else. What does that mean? It means you don't show your feelings? It means you go grieve alone? Who knows what that means? But he kind of conjured up something in his mind that basically he wasn't supposed to show his feelings or maybe even talk about it with his younger brother. I'm amazed at how many times people don't talk about death, talk about the one that's going. Why don't we do that? Why, why don't we talk about the people who have died? Is it not because we're afraid it'll stir up emotions that we don't know what to do with? And we don't want people to feel bad because feeling sad is bad? So, so do you see how the domino effect is of some of the misinformation that we've all grown up with? So the truth of the matter is you don't need to be strong for other people. If you've got someone that's, that's grieving, by all means, let them cry and tell them that they can, it's okay to cry in front of their children and that they can cry with their children, that those emotions are not bad or negative, that that's being authentic and that's being good. Another one that we hear all the time in our society is just give it time. After all, we know time heals all wounds. Uh, no. Correct actions are what heal, not time. I've had people come, and you know this to be true in your own life, with losses that were 20, 30 years ago that we just tried to keep busy or just give it time and it doesn't work. You know that. So just giving it time does not help. And the last one that I just mentioned is just keep busy. Please don't tell people just keep busy and just give it time because that does not help the healing process. That's not what recovery is all about. In fact, keeping busy, I want to tell you, I've had people that I've dealt with and with grief and loss who have kept busy. I mean, they have become workaholics in trying to conquer and deal with their recovery. And you know what happens? At the end of the day, when they crawl into bed, that wave of emotion sweeps over us, doesn't it? 
Just keeping busy doesn't help. Giving it time doesn't help. But there are some correct steps that we can do that we're going to share with you that will help. Another uh, information that we've had in our society uh, is based on the incredible landmark work of Dr. Kubler-Ross. And many of you know this as the five stages of grief. How many of you have been taught and are familiar with the five stages of grief? A lot of you. In fact, more of you than worked with the compound bow. But the truth of the matter is that her research was on those that had received a terminal diagnosis. And her whole account is on death and dying, not on those who had lost a loved one. But being trained in that early on in the five stages, I can remember going through that. Oh, let me see, denial, anger, bargaining. And usually our bargaining is with God, isn't it? If you do this, then I'll do that. And, um, and then the depression sets in. And then acceptance. Well, the truth of the matter is, as a counselor, that never worked with any of the people that I was working with. So I did some rearranging of those things, and I also added elements until I could find a program that I thought would work. And that's where I was totally pleased when I came across the Grief Recovery Handbook that we use because these guys agreed with me. <laughs> and not only that, not only did they include some of the elements that I think are so important for recovery, but they actually thought of things I didn't even think of. And uh, that's John James and Russell Friedman who I have been sharing a little bit of their story, who are the authors of the Grief Recovery Handbook that we use. And I want to tell you, I am so excited that it was two men that wrote this book. Because I think sometimes men get a bum rap. Uh, and people, we, we have a tendency to think that they don't know what they're talking about or they don't have feelings. The truth of the matter is they do have feelings, but they too have been strongly socialized within our culture that it is inappropriate for men to express their feelings. But at a time when John lost his son, he reached a point of actually being suicidal. And he took his revolver down to the beach with him, just about ready to take his own life. When he, I think, I can just kind of imagine that John shook his fist and said, if there is a God, you need to help me find a way out of this grief that I'm experiencing. And that was the results of him going on this journey that we've been able to find this information and I'm just so thrilled with what he's giving us. Well, the truth of the matter is there's some important things you need to know about grief. First of all, there are over 40 losses that cause grief. We automatically think of death or divorce. Those are the big ones. But did you ever think about moving or loss of a job? How about loss of health? Loss of hopes, dreams, and expectations. There are so many losses, over 40 different losses that um, we need to understand. So when you're working with someone, they may have lost their pet. To you, that may seem very minimal. And, and yet, for those of us who have pets and dogs, we know they actually become a member of the family, don't we? So we want to understand that there's more losses than just death or divorce. Also, um, we want to understand that grief is the natural and normal response to loss. So no matter what that loss is, grief is a normal reaction to that loss. In fact, also, um, we talk about grief as being the conflicting emotions with a change or end in any familiar pattern of behavior. Okay, do you get that? Conflicting emotions. Now, can you think of a conflicting emotion situation? Let's say that my mother has been uh, very ill for a long period of time and she dies. Now, my mother was my mentor. I miss her greatly. 
At the same time in my middle of my grief, I am very glad that she is no longer suffering. So I am experiencing sadness, but also relief that my mother is no longer in pain. So there's a conflicting feeling. Uh, look at a divorce and look at the conflicting feelings there. Okay, we've been living in a, a house that's full of turmoil and conflict, so I'm almost glad that that's over. And yet I just experienced the death of my marriage, a death of all the hopes and dreams of growing old together. Do you see the conflicting emotions that we can experience as we're going through this? And so these are some of the things you're going to hear as you're working with people uh, dealing with grief. Grief is also like reaching out for someone who has always been there for you. Only when you need them one more time, you really need them one more time, only to find out that they're no longer there. Now on the other side of the coin, if we talk about a less than loved one, any idea of who might be a less than loved one? <laughs> I heard that, <laughs> and I am a mother-in-law, so I am hoping that that's not true, <laughs> but it probably is. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so a less than loved one might be a mother-in-law. It might be an ex. It might be a boss that fired you or a good friend where the relationship uh, was severed and then you became very, very distant. So these relationships that we refer to as less than loved one, I'm going to wonder if my, uh, if my son-in-law is going to grieve or just how he's going to grieve when I die. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is we grieve even when it's a less than a loved one. Let me give you kind of an example. Um, less than a loved one is like reaching out for someone who's never been there for you before only when you need them one more time, they're still not there. And we grieve that loss. So be careful not to minimize if someone comes in that you're working with and they just found out that their ex of 15 or 20 years ago just died and you're wondering, why are you grieving? Because there is an, a unique relationship there. And grief, remember, is the normal and natural reaction or response to any loss of any kind. So that's important to understand. Okay, more facts about grief that I want you to get. Uh, grief is almost always about undelivered communication. Now this is where we get into the good part because this is where I'm gonna give you some tips on recovery, okay? Remember that grief is almost always about undelivered communications of an emotional nature. And then the next thing is, is that you will begin to understand that grief is also about wanting things to be more, better, or different. And so as we begin to explore, what are those things that you wish would have been better or different in the relationship? Do you wish that uh, the relationship had been different? Do you wish that the ending of the relationship might have been different? Or that you would have spent more time at home, more time with the family, more time playing rather than working? <coughs> Do you wish that you would have treated the person better? Better, different, and more are what you want to begin to explore with people and help them identify what were those things in the relationship. And then you want to find a viable way to help them communicate that. The best way that I know how to encourage you to do is have them write. Write that down. And then have them read that either to you or a trusted friend who will listen without any kind of judgment, analysis, or criticism. Critically important, right? Critically important that there's no analysis, no judgment, and no criticism. 
Uh, but that will help you with some of the recovery elements that are extremely important. In the outreach groups that we do on grief recovery, we actually have a very uh, well-defined process that we take people through to accomplish this. But what you can do will be of great benefit in hitting that target is when you help them to identify and asking them kind of some of the right questions uh, that will help them explore, well, what do you wish would have been different in that relationship? What do you wish would have been better? Or is there anything that you wish would have been more? Obviously, more time with the individual. <coughs> and those are extremely uh, important. <coughs> also, you'll see on your handout that I gave you that there's a whole list of practical things that you can do. And we've talked about some. Listen, next to your notes, if you want to put, be a heart uh, with ears, that would be kind of hitting the nail right on the head. Be a heart with ears without any kind of uh, judging, analyzing, or criticizing. Let the person talk. Let them express their emotions and their feelings appropriately in a safe environment. And then I said, learn to ask the right questions. Learn to ask the right questions. We have a list of questions that we recommend that will get you started in helping people. And I wasn't able to bring those. They actually are left at the office. But if you would like to uh, receive that list, uh, please go ahead and just sign up in the back on that uh, sheet, and we'll get you going on that. <coughs> I had a cough drop, and I'm not sure what I did with it. But also, um, as you're looking at... Uh, what to do with them. Explore, as we talked about, what's better, different, or more that they wish would have been there. And also, be proactive. Sometimes uh, what happens is that we say with people, hey, you know what, if there's anything that you need, uh, just give me a call, right? Are you going to call me? Are you going to call me? And the answer is no. Thank you. Oh. Ricola. Reminds me of Switzerland. I loved it. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, uh, we need to be proactive. I mean, if you're serious about helping someone that's grieving and going through a thing, uh, I like what my husband did. Uh, we just recently had a couple from our church uh, go through a very serious accident. And so he went to them and he said, you know what, our class uh, has decided we want to provide meals for you. We just want to know whether or not there's any dietary restrictions and uh, can we start bringing those meals in on Wednesday or whatever day. So be proactive. If the yard, if the grass needs cutting... <laughs> You're not in Tucson. <laughs> but if the windows need washing, set up a crew to go in and clean that thing and, and just make sure that you check it out with, with the uh, person that's there. But be proactive. Don't just say, if you need me, give me a call, because people won't do it. Uh, they don't want to be a burden on others. And so the tendency is, is that they won't do anything, and yet their needs are great. So be uh, proactive on that. Now, what to say and what not to say. I've already covered a lot of them, right? You are not going to say, don't feel bad. Yay. You are not going to say, Here's a Kleenex. I love it because you don't want them to wipe away their tears. You're not going to say, I know how you feel. Why would we not? And just give it time and keep busy. And you know what? If you just would find something meaningful to do, I'm getting more things here. This is wonderful. And actually, I think the action you guys took actually resolved my throat problem. <laughs> so I'll save these for next time. <laughs> Why don't we want to say, I know how you feel? Because maybe I went through the same thing. Hmm, do I know how they feel? We don't know how they feel. Even if we both lost our, our, our spouse, or we lost our child, or we both lost our parent. 
The reason why we don't want to say that is because we truly, truly do not know how they feel because each relationship is totally unique. And even in the same family with the same mother, each child has a unique relationship with that person and that parent. So please don't say, I know how you feel. And please, you know, there may be a time that you want to say I had a similar loss, but don't one-up them. <laughs> you don't need to share your personal uh, history or experience with them. Because again, it's really about them, isn't it? having a safe, non-judgmental environment where they can be totally free to express how they feel and what they're going through. So you don't want to say, I know how you feel. You also um, don't want to say, and this is so important, we talked about this, you just need to be strong for the kids. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's what we've been raised with, right? But we've got to be careful to let them know that it is okay to be genuine, authentic, and in fact, it will really help if people know that, you know what, I do have feelings, I do have emotions, and those feelings and those emotions are okay. So what can you say? Here you go. One of the things that really is true for me that I say a lot of times is I can't imagine how you feel. And you know what? I really can't imagine how you feel. We just heard this morning uh, a friend of Mark's who lost his wife giving birth to their fourth child. Can you imagine how he feels? Hmm. I can't even imagine how he feels. But here's a man that has a newborn baby, three other children, and just lost his wife. We don't want to say, I know how you feel for sure, but we can say, I can't imagine what you're going through. I can't imagine how devastating this is for you. And that will kind of uh, help. Now, one thing that we often say is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. Let's just talk one second about that, and then I want to get through th some things real quickly because I want to address some questions and answers and have some Q&A time. Uh, but one thing that we don't, well, you want to be careful how you use it is saying, I'm sorry, because I have heard people say, you're sorry. Why, why are you sorry? Uh, you didn't know the person. So you want to be careful when you use that term, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, it seems to be most acceptable if you know the person who has died or you know the person really well that is a, a close friend of yours that is grieving so that you want to be careful with regards to when you actually say that. I like this one the best. When you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Now, for some of us, that's really hard because I usually always have something to say. But the truth of the matter is, we want to be careful, don't we? Because we don't want to do more damage than good. So I love it. When you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Just be there for them. I've had people, and you probably know this yourself, though those of you that have experienced loss, that sometimes those that brought the most comfort to you were those that didn't say a thing. It was those that just gave you a hug. Or those that, I had one person say, you know what? One of my friends just came and sat for hours at the funeral home and just was always there in the corner, just sat there the entire time. Didn't say, didn't do a thing. But I want to tell you, that behavior spoke volumes to the person going through the loss. So don't be afraid of silence. There are many of us that really struggle with that. Silence is very uncomfortable for us. Learn to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable. In fact, as you try these new tools, you're stepping out of your comfort zone. I can guarantee you're going to feel uncomfortable. Yay! Because that means you're growing. And the more you stay outside of that comfort zone, the more you will begin to feel comfortable there. And the more effective you're going to be so that you can let someone just cry. And cry for five minutes if they need to or whatever. And then the next thing is dealing with children. 
I put some things on here because I just think this is incredible what we tell children about death. How about uh, God needed grandpa more than we do? Uh, what kind of uh, picture does that give them of God? That God needs my grandpa more than me? I don't get it. Or how about daddy went to be with Jesus? He did? Well, why is his body here? Um, grandma went to sleep then why doesn't she wake up? Do you see how we skirt the issue of talking about death and being able to help our children uh, grieve in a healthy way? Uh, please don't scold them for crying and send them to their room to cry or, what, grieve alone. They need that there. But what you do want to do is you do want to cry with them and, and tell them that the person has died and begin to explain to them what that means. And do explain to them about a funeral, what happens at a funeral, uh, and then you can look at giving them a choice of doing that. But the most important thing is model healthy grief yourself. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, remember I told you uh, kind of at the beginning to fasten your seatbelts, we were getting ready to take off. Do you, re you remember what they say at any time when you're taking a flight, right? The flight attendant comes on and she gives you her spiel about where the doors are and then she begins to go into her announcement about in the event of an unlikely water landing here in Arizona uh, and your oxygen mask come down from the compartment above, what do they tell you to do? Be sure to put the mask on your own mouth and nose first before helping your child. The reason why they do that is that they know that you've got to be able to breathe before you can help sustain the life of someone else. So I encourage you to look at your past losses what is it that maybe happened 20 or 30 years ago? Have you completed that grief process? Remember that recovery is about undelivered communications of an emotional nature. So consider, what is it that I wish I would have said? When I w first went through my certification class and uh, I decided to work on my father who died 25 years before, and if anybody had told me that I was going to benefit by working through uh, a loss of my father 25 years ago, I would have... You know, I just would have shrugged my shoulders and said, you've got to be kidding. My dad and I were close. We had a great relationship, no regrets, and, and everything. And so I went through the process with him. And I want to tell you, I benefited so much from it that that's why I'm so excited today to be able to share with you the steps that will help you complete the losses in your life, give you tools that you'll have in your tool belt to effectively deal with losses because we all know that we're going to deal with numerous losses and more and more as time goes on. But also, it's going to help you become more effective in how to listen with others and help them come alongside and be there for those who are grieving. So I hope that you will um, affect this information on your head and your heart and take this seriously and that you'll be able to remember it and become more effective in how you help others so that you can hit the mark without doing damage, <laughs> okay? There's a, a few question mar uh, questions uh, that we're going to take some time to ask. I don't know if any of you have any questions. Any questions uh, that came to you as we were talking? Yes. Okay, grief is always, almost always about undelivered communications of an emotional nature. And it oftentimes has to do with maybe hopes and dreams and expectations that were never fulfilled or those things that we wish would have been different or better in the relationship or more. And so helping explore that with people and begin to write a list. What do I wish would have been different or better. And actually, the process that we take people through, uh, the recovery elements that we use, is we look at putting those uncommunicated uh, delivery uh, 
communications in one of three categories. It's apologies. What is there that happened in my history in that relationship that I need to apologize for? What happened in the history of that relationship that I need to forgive them for? And then what are some of the other uh, uncommunicated statements that I would like to uh, communicate with that person? And the incredible thing about once we can identify these things and process it and share it with a trusted individual who will not analyze, criticize, or judge us, it actually helps us complete the relationship so that we can form a new relationship. We do not talk about bringing closure. And I want to tell you that bringing closure to people actually prevents many people from even wanting to go through grief recovery because they think if we bring closure and I close the door on that, then I'm going to forget the person or somehow I'm being disloyal to that person. So we don't uh, look at it as being closure. We talk about relationships being completed. And then that way, when we complete these unfinished communications that are generally of an emotional nature, it allows us to form a new relationship with that person. Now, I know that sounds a little weird. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have read uh, C.S. Uh, C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, but he does an incredible job. You would love reading, uh, reading his book. Now, some of you might say, I cannot believe he is shaking his fist so much at God because he really does in that book. In fact, he he says there couldn't be a God. There could not be a God that's a God of love and take my wife in the prime of her life and in the prime of our marriage because he lost his wife fairly soon after they were married. But he then begins to understand, and I love this, he begins to understand that all of these things that people say that may be against God or against different things are the expression of his emotions. They are not an expression of his doctoral stand or his belief system. It's just the expression of emotion that comes up, which is so uh, important why we don't want to judge, analyze, or criticize anyone. Got it? <laughs> okay. So I hope that answered your question a little bit. Um, I also did receive uh, a question ahead of time. It says, how can we be supportive in a joyful way without sapping all of the energy out of the entire group and grieving ourselves? Good question, isn't it? And the truth of the matter is, is that I'm hoping that after we've shared the information tonight, that you realize it's okay to grieve. It's okay to let them. In fact, Scripture tells us, Ecclesiastes tells us, there's a time and a season for everything, right? And Matthew tells us that blessed is those that mourn, for they will be comforted. And remember in 2 Corinthians where it talks, us, uh, talks to us about praise be to God who comfort, uh, comforted us in our trouble so that we can comfort others in any trouble? So it's okay to let the person grieve and, um, and mourn with them. Now, if it's getting where... Um, it's taking up. Now, you see, for, with me, I love talking about grief. I mean, to me, it's fun. It's exciting. And when you see someone that's actually grieving and doing it in a healthy way, you can be excited about that. I am so glad. It is a compliment to you when they are grieving and mourning in your presence because they are hoping and praying that it is a safe environment that they can do that without being judged and criticized. But if it's getting where it's disruptive to your entire group, I think there are some things that you can do. One of the things you can do is maybe ask a trusted class uh, mate who's got this material, okay? <laughs> to take the person out and kind of work with them and let them have a safe environment. Or sometimes you might even say in the midst of the group, you know, it, it, with their questions that, you know, we obviously don't have time here, and I want to be careful not to cut you short. So let's schedule a time after class that we can get together and talk and open that up. I also got another question. Oh, I love this question. Uh, there comes a time when each of us will go to be with God. How can we help our friends die well? I love that question. I don't you wish more people would ask it. Uh, uh, two things really quickly, and I know our time's leaving, uh, kind of getting away from us. But one, how to help your uh, friends die well. First of all, encourage them to live well. Uh, and by that I mean to live, and I encourage you to, to live with as few of regrets as you possibly can. When uh, we have 
friction between a relationship. You know, there's a reason why Scripture tells us don't let the uh, sun go down on your anger because you don't want a relationship to end like that. So keep your regrets to zero, okay? What I would encourage you to do is to encourage your friend to get to know God uh, through his word. I want to tell you, when times come rough, you want to be connected to Christ. I love what Paul said in Philippians. His heart's goal and desire was that I might know him. And you remember what he said, the power of his resurrection, and don't we all want that? Don't we all want to know God in that way? But he also went, and this chose the wisdom of Paul. He said, not only the power of his resurrection, but the fellowship of his suffering. How many of you are asking for that? How many of you are asking for that type of intimate relationship with Christ that you would understand the fellowship of his sufferings? And yet, it's as we know God's word. I tell you, you want to encourage people to die well, encourage them to live well, to know God's word. Also, encourage them to learn forgiveness. Forgiveness is a decision. It is not an emotion. So even in the midst of our anger or frustration, you can choose to forgive and not let that block your victory in your life. And practice forgiveness. Practice forgiveness so much. There are so many people in our lives that we get the opportunity to practice that, right? <laughs> practice it so that you become very well aligned with the steps of forgiveness. And then uh, I would say in, in living well is be extremely generous with grace and mercy. Extending grace and mercy to others, but also, and sometimes especially, to yourself. Because I want to tell you, there is no greater thing than I think Satan uses, other than being busy, to get his foothold in our life, to render us ineffective, defeat us in our Christian walk, than to not forgive ourselves, or to think I'm not good enough. So extend a lot of grace and mercy. Uh, live well. And then in dying well, I love this question. You know, one of the things that will, of course, help us in dying well and allowing our friends is to have someone that they can talk to without being judged, analyzed, or criticized, understanding that as the emotions give expression, there may be things that shock you, things that you can't believe are coming out of their mouth, but it's just a, a broken heart that is speaking. And then also, I strongly encourage you, ask the person who is dying what their concerns are. My most intimate conversation with my father was on his deathbed. And I asked him, I said, Dad, you know, is there anything that you want me to do or anything that you're concerned about with your death? Oh, you know, see, we're so afraid to talk about death, aren't we? I want to tell you, the person laying in that bed who's dying, they're thinking about it. And he just began to rattle off to me everything that he wanted. I want you and your sister to be with my, uh, your mom when I die. I want you to tell your mom that that gray suit in the closet is going to be fine. She doesn't need to buy a new one for me. I don't care what songs you sing at my funeral. You know, it <laughs> means nothing to me. And, and then I had a, a close friend uh, whose husband died of cancer. And I used that as an opportunity, too. And I said, Roland... Is there anything that's of concern for you before you die? And he said, absolutely. You know what? These people are anxious to talk about, but they need somebody out there that's willing to listen to them. So helping them die well uh, is one way. Let them talk. And the other thing that I have found, too, is that sometimes if you would play some music, some beautiful music, in the background, I've heard, had people tell me that that just seems to be so soothing and so comforting. The main thing I would tell you is don't be afraid of death. You know, Paul said for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I, my heart, that's one of my verses that I claimed kind of as a life verse. It's very interesting. Years ago, when I accepted and dedicated my life to Christian service, 
Because if we really truly believe that to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, there's no fear in talking about death. And God bless you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. It has been my delight. <laughs> I, I, this is the second time I've heard her, and both times, well, I, we talked about death, and I had a blast. So you figure that out. And just, there's a lot to learn. I just have a couple of announcements. I want to make sure I get them right, so I'm going to use my notes. Um, we have several things here at church uh, for those who are grieving, and I want to make you aware of them. Uh, our caring ministry, kind of the best way to find, about, uh, find out what we do when people need a little extra care is to look on our website under caring ministry. Uh, but one of them, and I see a lot of you out here tonight, is through our Stephen ministry. So if you are working with someone who is dealing with a loss, you, um, might, you need to keep that in the back of your mind. That if they have a special uh, need for someone to come alongside of them, we have trained people. They have over 50 hours of training. They've uh, also met with Bobby and had additional training on grief and on listening is probably the main thing. They would provide a confidential ear and walk along, alongside of that person like a friend through their difficult time. So uh, if you know of someone who needs a Stephen's minister, you can contact myself, or I know Trish Shelton is here, uh, and we can help get them hooked up. It does not have to be someone in our church. I mean, this is a wonderful way that we can even evangelize to our neighbors and our friends uh, is by offering um, them that tool. So. Uh, and that is all done in the name of Jesus, even though they might not always be there talking about Jesus. They are there uh, offering love uh, out of the name of Jesus. Uh, the second thing is we are starting a new grief class uh, for grief recovery, and that is for people who are actually grieving. And they could be grieving any one of those 40 uh, things of loss, so all, or all 40 at once, if they're a real mess, <laughs> no, not a mess, <laughs> going through a lot of loss. Um, the grief uh, recovery class is called Talk Grief. It's set up in a small group type atmosphere. It's being taught by uh, Linda Roberts. Raise your hand. Linda Roberts uh, is co-facilitating that. Linda is the coordinator of our um, parish nursing ministry. And also Penny Myers, raise your hand. Penny is the coordinator of our visitation ministry. We also have a visitation ministry that you should be aware of that's willing to go out to the homebound or people who are older. And just if they need someone to talk to on a short-term basis, it's not as intensive as Stephen ministry. Uh, so that grief class with Penny and Linda starts September 9th. Uh, it's a 10-week, I believe, course. Uh, it's going to be Sunday mornings at 845. And if you're interested in that, you can see myself, Penny, or Linda, and we'll show you where it is and make sure we have materials for you. That will run twice uh, this year, once in the fall and then once uh, in the, uh, starting in January. And one hope, we don't know exactly how it will unfold, is that it would then go to a small group type support uh, for those people as those relationships build. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead. I want to just read, uh, you mentioned Ecclesiastes, and I already had it open to that. Just a familiar uh, couple of verses from Ecclesiastes, and then I'll go right into prayer. So, uh, there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to tear down, and a time to build. A time to weep, and a time to laugh a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for the many seasons that you've afforded us. We thank you that you walk with us uh, through each of those seasons. We thank you for the, the emotions that you give us, which um, just add depth and purpose to our life. We thank you that you bring alongside us other Christians and believers and small groups and people who love us and a church and a community of um, people who sincerely can through and walk alongside us through these difficult times. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that you can use us to minister to others in your name. We just love you, Jesus. And I ask just a special blessing on all those that are here tonight as we take what we learn and go forth for, through the week. In your sweet name, we ask these things. Amen. You're dismissed.